All right. I think we can uh, we can start. Um, it's a it's a real pleasure for me to uh, uh, welcome uh, you all uh, at this seminar. Uh, the seminar will work as a, a launch for um, new book. Uh, uh, I think three days ago, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Data Ethics of Power, a new approach in the big data and AI era by uh, Gree Hesselbelk. Uh, the event is uh, uh, co-hosted by uh, my institution studies at John Cabot University and the uh, thing dataethics.eu of which uh, Dr. Esselbalk is the founder together with um, Pernille uh, Chanberg. Um, so as I said, it's a, it's a real uh, uh, honor for me also to welcome our distinguished uh, guests, Professor Frank Pasquale and Professor Natalie Smua, who will uh, together with us uh, start a conversation uh, about the uh, new book. Um, so a brief introduction uh, for um, uh, for you. I mean, uh, probably you are familiar with the uh, work that uh, Gree uh, has done uh, in the past uh, few years. Uh, but uh, just cap a little bit. Uh, I can tell you that she's an author and a scholar who's been working in the area of uh, data, data technology, society, ethics, and power. Uh, um, she's also the uh, co-founder of the European uh, Think Do Tank uh, Data Ethics U, and um, in a very busy uh, past uh, a few years, she's been also a member of the uh, EU um, uh, uh, high level expert group on artificial intelligence uh, that developed the uh, now world-renowned uh, ethics guidelines. Uh, she had uh, an, an intriguing uh, kind of uh, uh, contribution in that uh, uh, big uh, co-production of uh, 52 experts. Uh, she was one that uh, put forward and, and pushed for the group to adopt uh, the term of uh, trustworthy AI, which has become a bit of a staple uh, kind of uh, term to use in the conversation. Uh, she's a senior uh, key expert uh, now in the uh, in the new European Commission uh, International Outreach uh, Project. Uh, it's called the International Outreach for Human Centric Approach to Intelligence, uh, in touch AI. Um, and uh, she's uh, uh, also uh, collaborating on a project and leading the Data Pollution and Power Initiative at the University of Bonn. Uh, Institute of Science and Ethics uh, uh, Sustainable AI Lab. Uh, one thing that is important uh, to remember is the work of that these uh, two very powerful women, uh, Gri and Penille, have done uh, when in the 2016 they published uh, their first book called Data Ethics, The New Competitive Advantage. Uh, known to many, but also unknown to most, that was the first book that really coined the term data ethics. So that gave that term uh, a specific connotation. Um, that was a, a kind of early stage, and that uh, these two independent uh, women uh, that created the think tank had um, a lot of uh, courage and had to push really hard at the time uh, for what seemed to them an incredibly necessary step, that of considering the relation uh, the relations exist between the corporation and, uh, and the uh, corporations that were controlling uh, data streams. And the fact that uh, uh, there was a, an emerging debate uh, to be had about uh, the ethics of data. Uh, needless to say, uh, that uh, book and the term have acquired an incredible uh, kind of uh, uh, power and in the in the public debate and the conversation. And um, it's now uh, up to uh, Gruis to uh, elaborate further on her 
ideas and uh, further kind of integrating the ideas that were originally developed in a new book, uh, Data Ethics of Power. Uh, so without further ado, I'm pleased to uh, give the floor to uh, uh, Guri Yasebalk, who will uh, guide us through the core ideas uh, of the book. Okay, thank you, Francesco. I'm just going to share my screen because I'll make it a little more, a bit more. Um, so one moment. Let me see. Bear with me one second. I just have to do the presenter view. There we go. Everyone can see things well. Yes. Good. Perfect. I'll just move the this thing because it's getting in my way. Uh, okay. So well. So of course. Thank you. Francesco, thank you to the John Cabot University and, and, and uh, the Institute for Future and Innovation Studies and, and, uh, and uh, for hosting me at this event. And thank you to also to Natalie and Frank for, for being so kind to spend time to this afternoon and, and everyone here for, for listening in. Um, so uh, I want to begin with, hold on, I'm just trying to, I have this pictures of people in front of, can you see the, you can see the, ah, can't get rid of it. Well, so you'll have a little, now. It's no, no, it's a, perfect. We we only see you and the and the slides it's because you're ah, cold, you can see the others, but not ah, the others. So, so the others you cannot see it on the screen. No, no. Okay, okay. All right, so um, so I, I actually have to start this with a, with a little bit of a confession, um, which is a, a personal, uh, idea on personal events. So my, my very first uh, big purchase when I was around 11 years old was actually an electric typewriter, which says quite a bit about my very unfortunate ability to predict the future of ICTs. But on the other hand, it says a lot about my love for uh, the human written word and human culture. So my first very first degree was actually Nordic philology and literature. And of course, this is a really important note for me to start on uh, in my presentation of this book, the history of human culture, because one thing I've learned, particularly while writing this book, um, is that uh, in spite of all these transformations, disruptions, emerging technologies and issues we think we're experiencing and dealing with right, right now, we at the same time also building uh, on very, very rich human histories and cultures. And this, of course, includes very ancient human concerns and ethical dilemmas. And so this is where I really want to start my talk with a piece of human ancient narrative. So let me get to my next slide. So I don't know how many of you know the mythology of Odin, the king of Nordic gods. Uh, he actually only had one eye because he had sacrificed the other to gain an unconceivable amount of knowledge. And so instead of this one eye, he had his two ravens, Hugin, uh, which means thought in Old Norse, and Moon in memory or mind in Old Norse. Um, and these, can, these two ravens, they can see, they can hear uh, everything, and they can remember everything, and they can actually also predict the future. And Odin, he's really dependent on these ravens, and even though he worries, he still lets them roam the world every day. And of course, Odin, he understands also that this is a delegation of his human powers that he has to accept to be able to control the present and see the future. So these concerns of these ancient Viking gods, uh, I believe, spell out uh, human anxiety about uh, and, uh, and an anxiety that I think that we need to revisit in the present debate on the ethics of the powers of big data and AI. Um, so one thing, so what we need to think about today is which trade-offs are we willing to accept in our this yearning we have to surpass the limits of the human body and mind when we're developing and when we're adopting and regulating AI and big data. And here we could learn from audience anxiety about the potential loss of memory, mooning, because what is a thought, hooking, an intellect, 
uh, what is a machine that thinks like, for example, an artificially intelligent data system without the situated dynamic qualities of human memory, mooning and experience. Now, my book uh, contributes to debates on data ethics, uh, big data and artificial intelligence in three ways. So first, it provides an analytical framework that I call a data ethics of power, um, where we shift this current, uh, I could, we could always call obsession with values of technologies to the structural power dimension of the big data and AI society. Secondly, I make a, an analysis uh, or an analysis of the role and, and the function of what I refer to as data ethical governance. And then thirdly, I'm presenting a foundational study of the human centric approach or what I prefer to call a human approach. So overall, um, my book is about data ethics. It's about governance and about the transformation of power in the era of big data and AI. But more importantly, it's about human power. So what is our role in all of this? Now, uh, let me take off on a more positive note uh, about the current state of affairs in data ethics policy and public debate. So what I see right now is a really encouraging turn where this conversation we've seen over the years on data ethics and AI ethics has finally matured into a main topic of public debate uh, and a very crucial policy agenda item in Europe and also beyond. And this, of course, also means that right now we have a range of stakeholders from industry, academia and civil society to governments and intergovernmental organizations that we haven't seen before, presenting and trying to solve the, the different and various critical problems that have been in, identified in our current data infrastructures. So we can think of things like data bias, disempowerment of consumers, democracy challenged by black box algorithms, flawed IT security and data protection, data monopolization, voter met, uh, manipulation, and, and many more things like this. And this is where my book comes into the picture. So how do we humans then with our ethical capa capacities, because those we still have, change the direction of a social technical development that we've identified to move contrary to our human values that are challenging things like human dignity, cohesion, agency, responsibility, and also democracy. So different stakeholders with various interests, they identify uh, different problems and as follows, they also propose just as diverse solutions that may or may not clash or be in conflict. Actually, we have in, uh, we are right now in a historical moment uh, in this, uh, what we could call a, tra traject a trajectory of the development of uh, a digitalized society where we are seeing controversy between different interests more clearly and this transformation of power uh, that I talked about before taking material form. And so what I'm proposing is uh, that to achieve the change that we need in the age of big data and AI, we need a more reflective look at this moment in history, because it is in moments like this, the, the, the most controversial moments where critical problems become visible and when values and interest negotiation take this kind of st center stage and compromises are made. And it's in these moments like this that this, these social technical transformations that we need take form. Now, I, I want to outline the key themes of my book. And as a point of departure, the book, of course, as said, it's an analysis of this transformation of power in the big data and AI area. So there's no surprise in that. But more importantly, in the book, as I said before, I propose that instead of the current focus on just the values of data ethics, which, as we can see in the debate, uh, right now can basically mean anything, Instead of this, we readjust our attention to power as the main focal point of our data ethics. And I'll try to explain to you how and why here. So the data systems that we create to make sense of, organize and control life um, and society also have always in human history reinforced power dynamics. And often we've seen this with devastating consequences. 
but they've also transformed throughout history. So today we have this conversion of everything into data as an effortless, as a costless and a seamless extra layer of life and society. And this is one transformation that I in my book argue, it requires a particular kind of reflection and awareness from us. So at this moment uh, in time, there are different approaches to AI and data competing at a national, at a regional, and at a global level to gain what the historian uh, Thomas P. Hughes, he, he calls as technological momentum, where local systems are evolving into larger, more integrated global systems. So we have a competition that is playing out in front of our eyes between different technological systems and styles of scientists, of developers and entrepreneurs and with different requirements and expectations from citizens and lawmakers, but with no real open conversation about their underlying power dynamics. And this is why I propose this data ethics of power that is basically concerned with making visible the distribution of power in the big data society. And I do this to create a basis for alternative design, business policy, social and cultural processes that support what we could call a human centric distribution of power. So in my book, I look at this moment that we're in right now <clears throat> with one set of ethical guidelines after the other and principle also the principles being introduced, um, data ethics committees and AI eth ethics expert groups, new laws proposed and stakeholders, including academic disciplines competing to dominate the AI and data technological momentum of the 21st century. Because data ethics is actually not only about power, it also is power. It's power for governments, uh, companies, uh, self-proclaimed experts and advisors, and even, as I said before, academic disciplines to point out the problems and their solutions to set the priorities for what role data technology should play in our human lives and society. So in the book, I ask you to think about different kinds of infrastructures of power that facilitate our lives, our cultures, our politics and economy. And I ask you to think about and imagine alternative infrastructures of power, should power not take a different form. So I describe three currently competing infrastructures of power in the book. So to take the first one, the first one uh, we could call a big data social technical infrastructures or in short i call them bdstis they have physical properties with fiber cables that run across the globe they that enable data collection and access also across geographic territories and jurisdictions and they have virtual network properties so here in the early 21st century these digital data systems they've become this mundane background against which social practice social networking identity construction, economy, culture, and politics are conducted. And they are the infrastructures of all of these things in part institutionalized in, in systems requirements, standards for information to technology, IT practices, and also in regulatory frameworks for things like data protection and other things. And they invested with human imagination about the perceived endless opportunities of big data. They also constitute a redistribution of power, as Manuel Castells has shown, to design and shape them is an essential form of power. And as David Lean have illustrated really eloquently, um, we see how surveillance powers of state and industry actors are embedded in their architecture and design. So then secondly, we have the artificial intelligence social technical infrastructures, or in short, ISTs. They're designed to sense the environment in real time, learning, involving, uh, and evolving with autonomous or, or semi-autonomous agency. And so this is basically what happened. Um, amplified computer power and this vast amount of data generated by the BDSTIs has empowered things like machine learning technology to technologies to, for example, evolve and learn to recognize faces in pictures, uh, which we call pattern recognition in images, facial recognition. They've learned to recognize speech from audio with pattern recognition in audio, voice recognition, to drive a car, for example, autonomously rendering objects in an environment and performing a risk assessment, and to understand the individuals when micro-targeting services and information. This is called profiling and personalization. 
And so these and many other capacities are all increasingly intertwined with our human decision making in all areas of our lives. Now, if a data ethics of power is concerned with making invisible power dynamics visible, then what we need to address here is, is how ICES and also BDSCIs, these artificial intelligence and, and big data social technical infrastructures, how they work as cultural systems with socially ordering properties that reflect societal power dynamics and interest. So data is the resource of big data and AI infrastructures. And so, of course, it is also the locus of interests. We can here think about different data cultures and their cultural systems of uh, meaning making as interests that shape the social technical infrastructures of our everyday lives. So take, for example, uh, things like a personal AI assistant like Amazon's Alexa or Google Now and Microsoft's Cortana. So we could think of them as just that, assistants that help a user in a personalized manner. But we can also think of them in the context of the cultures that support their development and here the kind of big data mindset that have reinforced huge asymmetries of power between citizens and powerful interests in society, like big tech, big tech companies, but also different governmental agencies. And so this is one very concrete dimension of the power problem of the current era of big data and AI. But there's also another power problem that I draw attention to in my book. So if we think more carefully about these new capacities, these new agencies and decision making capabilities of in particular <clears throat> the AI social technical infrastructures, then our concern with their power also becomes more existential in nature. So very similar to the current concerns of this old Viking uh, god Odin. So let me uh, ask you once again, as I did in the beginning of this talk, which trade-offs are we as humans willing to accept just to surpass what we see as limits of the human body and mind and society when we're developing, adopting and regulating ICES? So this is something we have to think about. <coughs> Now, and this is where we arrive at the third kind of power that I describe in my book as human power. And I detail what this means in depth with reference to the early 20th century uh, philosopher Henry Bergs, who not only created the first traffic jams uh, on Broadway in New York because of his popular lectures at that time, he also won a Nobel Prize in literature and as a person of Jewish descent, went to a police station in Paris to register in a data system of power of that time at the beginning of the Second World War. But more importantly, also on whose writings, not only my data ethics of power is based, but in fact, also the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights. So in short, uh, what human power means uh, is that it, it has a situated qualitative dynamic shape. So unlike the power of ICs and BDSCIs, it has potential to be self-reflective and importantly to be critical. So the third infrastructure of power that I describe in the book is one of human empowerment, of course. And this, I argue, is particularly challenged in our current reality because human power needs specific spatial and temporal conditions to flourish. The problem is that now here in the early 21st century, human ethical agency is in constant negotiation with the moral agency of these social technical infrastructures of power that I've just described, the BDSTIs and the ICs. They not only materialize power dynamics, but they also challenge human ethical agency to negotiate and revolt against these powers in fundamental ways. So think about all the stories we hear about biased facial recognition systems or algorithmic fraud detection applied in low income neighborhoods, algorithmic gradings of students, for example. What is constantly repeated in these stories is this feeling of disempowerment of the people who are caught by these systems. So basically human power doesn't resemble, it doesn't correspond with, it doesn't live well or flourish in the cracks of the BDSTIs and the IC structures of power. And so this is, of course, why we really urgently need what I call the human approach in data ethics with an emphasis on human processes, responsibilities and critical agency. So data ethics has to become more than just a moral obligation, this set of program rules, it has to be human. 
So as I write in my book, we can formulate data ethics guidelines, principles and strategies, and we can even program artificial agents to act according to their rules. But to ensure a human centric distribution of power, data ethics has to take the form of culture to become a cultural process lived and practiced as a way of being in the world. And this is a data ethics that enable us to imagine alternative social technical data infrastructures and systems that interact with human agency and power and ethics in a different way. It is a data ethics that enables design and governance, uh, which ensure the involvement of human life, experience and critical agency in the very data designs. We can think of data trust here in the governance, use and implementation of data systems. And it is a kind of data ethics that goes well together with legal frameworks that ensures, as Frank uh, Pascale, who's here tonight, uh, calls it, and defends human expertise. So it's also a data ethics that often comes from a lived experience of being targeted and outside, the kind of experience and voice that in fact is most often not the loudest one in public and policy debates on AI and big data. But we, that we see right now is a voice that is regaining power by reappropriating the debate on its own terms. So it's, the, of course, the voice of marginalized social groups and regions, uh, which is also a voice that doesn't always accept uh, without question these sometimes, which is presented, highly technical solutions to the complex problems and implications of big data and AI systems. Because data abuse, of course, is, is not a technicality. Um, so to conclude with my book, I'm asking policymakers, practitioners, companies and institutions to think about the powers of AI and data. And I ask, while you are achieving what you dream AI and data can do, think also about what kind of societies you're creating, which infrastructures of power do these uh, technologies support. And of course, I'm hoping that the democratic, humanly empowering infrastructures of power serving the human interest, empowering humans. But this is not a certainty. We need to guide that narrative. And of course, I agree that to achieve the change we need, it does seem overwhelming, the complexity of issues, the challenges we're facing, and the compromises that we feel we have to make every day. But as I'm also arguing in my book, we shouldn't despair because we are in our very human capacity in control of all of these compromises. But of course, only if we see the entire field of powers and interests that are always invested in a social technical transformation. And this, of course, includes our own biases. And, and on and that note, I'll conclude my presentation here. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, So I'd like to uh, kind of move the conversation uh, forward a little bit. Um, I'd like to introduce um, our first respondent, uh, who's uh, probably uh, well known to all of you. Um, uh, we are talking about uh, Professor Frank uh, Pascale. Um, uh, who's going to tell me how what's the correct way of pronouncing his last name? Because in in Italy we would say Pasquale, and I'm always uh, wondering. Uh, and he uh, said, <laughs> "Sorry, oh Pasquale is good. Thank you." Yes. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, you know that's the because it, I've always heard it in the kind of let's call it the American spelling, uh, basically, you know. But uh, yeah, so he's an expert in uh, in uh, in law of artificial intelligence, uh, among the many other things, algorithms and machine learning. But I'm sure that it's uh, known to most of you uh, for his uh, magnificent book, uh, The Black Box Society, The Secret Algorithms That Control Money and Information. Uh, it was uh, uh, an absolutely uh, landmark uh, uh, book in uh, information law and one that we have all read, as we probably uh, have already uh, read his uh, newest book, uh, The New Laws of Robotics, Defending Human Expertise in the Age of AI. And uh, I don't think there's uh, uh, anyone that can be more qualified than, uh, than uh, Frank to uh, 
uh, talk uh, about uh, how uh, relations established by uh, artificial intelligence, data, and technology in general. So I'm very pleased to give you the floor and uh, and start the conversation with Guri. Well, thank you so much, Francesco, for that very kind introduction. And um, it is really a great honor to be here to uh, comment on the momentous occasion of uh, Gris' new book. I think that Data Ethics of Power is really an incredibly important contribution to our understanding of AI ethics and of the future of um, where the, the meeting place is between academic expertise um, and policy discourse. And I think it, it, you know, it takes a, a truly uh, remarkable, a remarkably skilled and gifted author um, like Gree to be able to bring together those two worlds because they are very different worlds. They have many different conflicts and, and uh, it's, it's, it's hard to write in this space, I find, because it's, it's easy enough to sort of write, I think, within entirely a policy space or entirely an academic space. Uh, but to bring them together, you always run into the, the difficulties of, um, or you run into the, the, the risks of either being accused of oversimplifying or of overcomplicating or what have you. And I think that what Data Ethics of Power does in a, in a really um, illuminating way is to show a, a middle way through those ideas. I also wanna say that, you know, um, or through those, those uh, possibilities. I also wanna say that I think that there's um, part of the, the rationale for writing a book is that you feel that there are some received ideas, received wisdom out there that you wanna challenge. And I think one way to understand um, Gris' book, and I think to really uh, appreciate the importance of its contribution, is to set on the table some of the established ideas, or at least some very common ideas about AI ethics and sort of the overall transition toward a more computational future. And then to contrast them with the human-centric approach that um, she articulates so well. And so just to get those on the table, I'm gonna get these, uh, these ideas on the table, these tensions between, I think, a, a certain beyond pensance, you know, received wisdom uh, approach and, and uh, uh, what, what data ethics as power is doing, and then try to uh, apply them in a few concrete contexts where I think that this new book um, helps us see a better way forward. So to start with, you know, I think that the, there's a really um, common view in a lot of technology discussions now that there's no ultimate metaphysical distinction between human beings and machines, right? And, and there's a, a good commentator, Byron Reese, who often asks his um, uh, interviewees whether they think we are at foundation, machines, animals, or something beyond the machines or animals. And, and he commented that among his Silicon Valley interviewees, almost everyone said, well, humans are reducible to machines. You know, there's really no magic spark there or anything like that. I mean, or even to, to sort of characterize it in that way, to, to talk about magic is to almost uh, um, denigrate the, uh, the very idea, right? But he said that when he talked to most people, they felt there was a pretty clear difference between humans and machines, right? And I think that this is a very important contribution of this book to um, uh, put forward the idea that there's, there are distinctions between humans and machine artifacts and I think that's important in terms of, uh, and, and of course, um, uh, Gree is, is fully aware of you know, actor network theory and all the other sorts of approaches that try to you know, uh, blur that distinction. And I think very skillfully uh, handles them in the book, but at foundation to defend and promote a human centered approach, you've gotta be able to draw some of those lines. And I think the book does that well. The second point I would say is that, you know, that there's a common view now that AI ethics discourse is displacing regulation. You see a lot of worry out there saying, well, you know, we should be cracking down on tech companies, but instead they've turned uh, the, this into an ethics talking shop or something like that, right? And I think that that's completely wrong. And I think that, you know, one of the, uh, there's really no tension between AI ethics conversations and regulatory conversations. And in fact, the AI ethics conversation is an intellectual foundation for regulation, right? And we need very strong intellectual foundations for regulation because there are the entities uh, out there that are capable of uh, judicially overturning them or in other ways, you know, sort of uh, 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 weakening uh, regulatory frameworks. And so we need a strong foundation there. And I think that the, what's particularly ingenious about uh, connecting ethics and power, which are often things that are held in contrast, 
is to say that ideally we want to connect the two in order to promote the idea of a data ethics that has real bite, that has real impact, as opposed to this strict separation between the philosophical and the practical, the vita activa versus the vita contemplativa, you know, from, from Arendt's uh, categories. And I think what's, what's very philosophically sophisticated about that is that, you know, Hannah Arendt herself often would, would say that we, we need to not just look at power as a bad thing, but, you know, it's a power as the power to do things that are quite positive. And I think the book really lays out a framework for that. The third um, sort of old or common or dominant view um, that I think the book really disputes is the view that it's impossible to set global values and goals for AI because every jurisdiction is different, that we're sort of stuck in um, potentially, we, we can never have like a, a, a global um, baseline. And this view even goes so far as to promote the idea that, you know, it's, it's too ambitious for say, the United States or the European Union or a country as large as China to even have its own AI uh, rules that there's gonna be diversity within any of those entities, right? Um, but I think that the part of another, yet another uh, of Greece contributions is to say that there are foundational human values and that cultural relativism should not deny their relevance in the development of AI law and policy. And you know, I, I think in turning to Bergson and turning to other philosophical foundations for identifying some of these um, very important human values, um, including love, which I think is, is you know, an incredibly rare to see in a book uh, on AI uh, ethics and policy, but I think is, is critical. You know, it's critical to sort of to recognize that there are some really important qualities, normative dimensions of human experience that are far beyond, you know, the purely rational or the pure, those that can uh, be translated into um, uh, language, much less, much less computer code. You know, and in that way, it has a very Wittgensteinian foundation here, you know, that, that in terms of thinking about that, that the ineffable, um, and yet some things that are, are encoded in experience and perhaps as, as the earlier presentation by Gree suggests, um, only able to be gotten at or um, evoked in literary depictions or in uh, mythic depictions, but they may now themselves be extremely hard to um, uh, give a, say, um, uh, computational or linear, uh, linearly argued approach. So I really like that because I think that what's what's fascinating is that so much of the critique of black boxes has sort of uh, tried to contrast the AI uh, as the, the the mystical and the uh, those demanding explanation as the um, uh, the practical rational. And I think that what's fascinating is that you know we can we can also say that there is a certainly a critique of AI that goes beyond the practical rational that roots rooted in human experience. And so I think that, that, that these contributions are really important because they, they cash out in, I would say, very different approaches to the long term of tech policy, right? Looking over decades and not necessarily, and, and certainly there, there are current uh, uh, debates that we can apply them to, but I want to think about the long term for now. And for example, you know, with teaching robots, um, uh, uh, the Sharkies, Amanda and Noel Sharkey, have written about the problems of robot nannies, robot teachers, et cetera. Um, but you hear a lot of individuals who say, okay, well, current human beings may be, uh, current, current kids may have been raised by human teachers and it would be jarring for them to have a robot teacher. But if they were to start from the very beginning with a robot teacher, then that would be their preference. And it might even be upsetting to them to then later have a human teacher, right? And, and I think that that falls in with the idea of no metaphysical distinction between uh, humans and machines um, and um, the idea that, you know, and, and, and the sort of relativistic side there of the, of the received wisdom. Whereas I think if you really uh, develop a human-centered data ethics of power, you're going to constantly be thinking about the relative autonomy of humans versus machines and be somewhat worried about a world in which um, individuals are conditioned from their earliest experiences to uh, obey and to uh, take as a role model uh, something that's purely mechanical and does not share a biological substrate with them. I'd also say that this is with respect to um, therapy. There's lots of very interesting discussions now about mental health therapy and, and therapy by uh, an, an app-based mental health therapy. And I think that if, again, if, if one is thinking entirely in the older terminology and older terms that do not center the human, one might say, well, that's just one more human job that we're going to cede to the robots, just as we, we, we at one point we had human beings putting together 
cars, uh, hand hand making cars. You know, we we now have robots doing most of that, and you know, just as at one point we had human beings in a therapeutic role. Well, we'll eventually just have bots do that and we'll have human beings do something more productive. But um, the problem there, I think, is that it really elides the possibility that the interpretation of maladies, the interpretation of um, uh, feelings of unease, of displeasure, of anxiety, of depression, that that in itself is something that uh, is, can be dealt with um, and it, 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 or is dealt with at present in a framework that empowers certain human beings to help others in interpreting those in a very transparent and one-to-one -one direct way. And we, we lose something if we allow, say, one company to develop an app that can, say, help interpret these maladies um, for the same way, in a cookie cutter same way for thousands or millions of individuals, right? But that's a, that's a session of human power to machines. And, and we've got to be thinking very clearly about um, that not simply being identical to in scope or kind, um, having a, um, uh, a manufacturing robot. And, and I will say that like perhaps even in some areas we've gone too far with, with food, for example, you know, if we think about sort of the cookie cutter type food versus you know, human beings making it, there's, there are great questions even be raised about robotization and AI in, in, in that sector. And you know, finally, a final example would be policing and I won't belabor the point, but I'll just say that you know, there's something very, uh, it, however, um, the discourse about policing is moving in various jurisdictions. There's something profoundly different about having a human versus a robot uh, impose the power of the state. And I think that that again is something that, you know, if we, we look at the foundational human values in um, the data ethics of power, we, we come to that conclusion. And so I, I think that, you know, what, what I think is wonderful and in, in closing on my comments, and of course, there's lots more to discuss. What I think is fantastic about this book is, is one of my favorite philosophy articles is by Charles Taylor and it's called Foucault on freedom and truth. And what he says is that ultimately Foucault offers a critique of mystification and of lies. He genealogizes them um, and he offers a critique of power. But in order to really have a concept to move beyond the critique, we have to have an idea of freedom and of truth and of what those qualities are. And I think what data ethics of power does is it bridges us from the critique of power that is now common and very valuable in AI ethics discourse to a vision of the more, uh, of, of, of a positive horizon for the realization of human values and the maintenance and promotion of human flourishing. So that, I, I, I thank you so much, Gree, for this work, and I really look forward to the conversation. Thank you. So perhaps you, uh, to respond uh, first. And Okay, well, um, thank you, and I'm I'm just honored. As, I mean, Francesco said the the work that you've done yourself, Frank, and in this field is 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 amazing. And and as you probably the ones that read my book will see that I have quoted Frank quite a lot in the book also. Um, uh, and I think that you know. Uh, uh, that's also why I've actually was asking Frank to maybe read this and, and comment on it, because I think that some of the work that you've done in particular in, in the legal sphere really is, an un, is a really good understanding of exactly this human approach where, where we're thinking about something that is particular about uh, humans and, and, and very particular about our human reality. Uh, that I think that we're sometimes forgetting in this kind of both in the innovation field and the business field, but also in the regulatory field, we sometimes tend to forget how to to carve these spaces of human freedom and agency. Um, I, I like that you at the very end that you that you that you say that I provide a positive horizon because that is actually what I try to do with this book, because. Uh, as, as also Francesco he said, me and Pernille Tranberg, when we wrote our book and we also established a data ethics think tank with uh, Birgitte Kofod, um, I mean, we did do that uh, some years ago in a, a kind of on a little bit uh, as a kind of critical on a critical note. So, so we were worried about the way we were seeing the way that uh, data technologies was incorporated in our lives. I was I used to work with children and young people and new technologies and and what I started with seeing at that point was I saw some really positive things going on uh, at the first 
there were ways of young people to play and do things. There were many opportunities uh, with new technologies and social media was starting, uh, uh, rising up. And there were many ways that children could use it to play or to get their own space. But then suddenly, or not suddenly, but we were realizing that there was a kind of uh, contrary power that was getting into this space of young people, but also generally in our lives that was a, uh, that was in some way inhibiting all the positive things we could have done with these technologies. So, um, so, so what I've been trying to do with this book and basically with my entire body of work has always been to say, yes, you say innovation and, 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 and technolo technological innovation and these things should be like this, but there's different ways of doing it. So we can do innovation, for example, when we had the GDPR coming out, we had this thing that Oh, the GDPR is an obstacle to innovation. Privacy is an obstacle to innovation. And, and, and what we were trying to do and what I've been trying to expand on also in this process is to say, no, um, innovation can take a different form. We can have more of a balance between uh, this kind of human reality. I, I talk about cultural critical moments in my book, which means that it's a space where you have space for human agency and critical reflection. So you can build, for example, an AI agent, uh, but it doesn't take over, for example, a judge's decision-making process or a doctor that is uh, trying to heal someone in a, in a room. It supplements the human agency and it, and it ensures, for example, it will push you to t think creatively or think, uh, it won't take over your creative efforts. It won't take over your critical agency. It will push you to think more critically or give you space to, and that's why I mentioned data trust, for example, it's a space where individuals can get access to their data and they can get benefit from their data and they can correct their data. So that's a kind of example of that. So I really like this point of, of ending on a positive horizon because that's exactly what I'm doing with my book. I'm not saying that I don't wanna, I'm just saying things can be done differently. We, we have a development that is going, that has been developing contrary to some very human centric values and we need to re uh, guide that narrative and we can do that in design we can do that in regulation we can do that in even in the things that we request from technologies and policymakers ourselves um so i think that's i mean we can continue the conversation afterwards because i think that's uh, you know uh, that, that 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 is probably the the key point. I don't I don't want to take too much time now because I think we should converse a little bit afterwards. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, our next uh, respondent um, is uh, Natalie Smua. Uh, some of you might uh, already know Natalie. Uh, all of you should know uh, Natalie. Uh, she's a faculty member uh, at the Department of International and European Law uh, at the QE in Leon in Belgium. And uh, before uh, going back and returning to academia, Natalie worked as an associate uh, uh, in international law in a firm in Brussels, uh, advising companies on EU competition law and uh, EU regulation more generally. Uh, but importantly, also, uh, Natalie had a key uh, function uh, in the uh, now famous European Commission um, uh, high level expert group on artificial intelligence. And he was uh, the coordinator of, the, uh, of that effort. Um, what you should know about Natalie is that a, a reputation in the policy uh, kind of uh, group uh, is uh, uh, that of a rising star. Uh, there's uh, no doubt that uh, uh, Natalie will be uh, more and more recognized as a positive uh, global force in the in the discourse. So it's it's really an honor for me to have uh, Frank Gruy and and uh, Natalie having this conversation. Uh, so I'm I'm leaving now the floor to Natalie to to for uh, remarks. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's um, it's a pleasure to be here. And well, I've come to know Ngru in the high level expert group um, and immediately was a great fan of, of her and her approach also in the group. Um, it was already said that she pushed for a number of things that really stood out in the work of the group, like the term trustworthy AI, but also very important maintaining a positive atmosphere so making sure that that data ethics is not seen as an obstacle to innovation but really trying to marry both and what I really appreciated about Gru's role in the expert group is that she was able to bridge I think the sometimes black and white distinctions um, between you know industry uh, civil society academia she kind of transcended these different um, groups and try to merge um, a vision that she already had then and that she now wrote down in the book. Um, at least that's the way I look at it. So I was very happy to, to read it. And I'm very happy that I, that I get to comment uh, on it now. And I think there won't be um, as much of a critical view because I, I just agree with, with the framework um, and it's very much in line with, with my own thinking. Um, over the past years as well, which is no surprise, uh, I think. So let me maybe just, you know, give a, give a few reflections on things that I particularly liked about uh, the book and where I see their relevance also, especially for the global um, debate on AI legal and ethical frameworks. Um, because I think we're really now in a period where these spaces of negotiation that Gru is talking about in the book are literally taking place in international fora. Um, they're literally negotiating um, frameworks on how to govern AI. And these frameworks uh, of negotiations are in themselves also artifacts, right? The, the legal frameworks that we are creating now will also give certain affordances um, or exclude certain affordances. Um, for the years to come. And so a first point um, that I want to make about the book is that I'm, I'm really pleased that Crew has managed to um, give ethics back the role it should have. Um, and I'm saying this because um, I think for a bit too long, the way in which ethics um, is relied upon in AI policy debates um, is, too, is too weak in the sense that either it's seen as something that can orient technology towards this is an acceptable use, and thereby you actually also legitimize the widespread use of the technology, which is taken for granted, or um, at worst, ethics is instrumentalized as a quality label to just stimulate um, the adoption of AI as part of this narrative of progress, as if there is a linear progress narrative in which AI is inevitable and it will keep on improving humanity regardless of how we will govern it. And, and that is also why ethics has, has come under fire as, as Frank pointed out, and why some people said, oh, we don't need ethics, we need law because law is a real thing which is of course a very short-sighted way of looking at it because they complement each other and, and obviously an ethical framework can provide the normative guidance of how legal norms um, should be created, um, but they're very complementary. Um, and so what I like about the book is that it brings together this ethical narrative, which is way broader than the way ethics is being discussed now in policy discussions. It's really about um, a methodology for a critical inquiry, um, which is what ethics uh, should be. Um, and I think the book offers a framework for doing that, as Frank already said, a vision for, for bridging that critical gap. Um, it's more than just about compliance, but it's a mode of inquiry. And what I love about the book is that it draws on STS, surveillance studies, infrastructure studies, and many other disciplines, the law and bringing that together. Um, and, and this is really, I think, what, what is needed and what is still missing in many policy debates, this interdisciplinary approach. There is already some recognition that we need to work in a multidisciplinary way in order to understand how AI works. But too often that is understood as let's make lawyers talk with engineers. And it kind of ends there. And of course, that's not enough. Uh, that's not going to give you this more holistic point of view 
that is needed. So I want to touch upon three, I think, um, points where uh, the push towards a more holistic vision is, I think, very important and also very helpful for policy debates. Um, and, and I hope that whomever reads the book will be able to take that um, with them as well. So the first um, point that I especially liked is the fact that Gruis is, 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 uh, is giving this vision of a human approach as opposed to a mere human-centric approach. Um, so she goes beyond this human centricity, um, which uh, also involves um, the fact that you know, this, this, this shape of, of governing these um, big data, socio-technical spaces, it's not just about humans, but it is human. Um, and she draws on Bergson for that, um, and, and she mentioned his Jewish heritage. And there's another Jewish philosophy who also drew on Bergson, which is Emmanuel Levinas. And I think this really resonates as well to what he said, because for him, he says, ethics is the first philosophy, by which he means that human beings are essentially ethical beings, even before they are rational beings or emotional beings, um, and that ethics comes even before ontology. Ethics is what we are rather than, than what we should be even. And this is, I think, the point that is being made here as well. If we don't take a human approach, an ethical approach to the governance of big data and AI, we're just going to lose an essential part of our humanity along the way. Um, so it's not just about how we should be acting, but it's about how we are. Um, and if we don't do this, we deny ourselves our own humanity and, and, and dehumanize ourselves. So we need to have a dialogue with each other and, and listen to each other. And I think focus on that ethical responsibility um, that is so essential for human beings, which of course goes beyond an anthropocentric view um, of the world, but also includes the broader environment. Um, and that is, I think, something that policymakers today should still learn from. You also see that these environmental concerns, for instance, and this sense of human responsibility is still a bit too marginalized. Uh, you don't see it yet sufficiently in policy debates. And it's also still too individualistic, which is something um, I'll get back to. And the second point that I very much appreciated is this sense of shedding light on these spaces of negotiation. Um, so the fact that a data ethics of power is not about power, it is power, uh, which I found a very powerful statement. Um, and that also means that the power to raise issues and how we frame data ethics issues within governance debates is so crucial, which means that the way that international fora are shaped, in which AI is being discussed right now, and I'm thinking of the Council of Europe, UNESCO, the European Union, and not only intergovernmental organizations, but also at national level or NGOs or private actors, the framing that is going on in these spaces of negotiation is very important. Uh, and who participates in those debates and who has the time and resources to participate in these debates is also crucial. And you see that right now these actors, a lot of actors are trying to claim uh, a space of negotiation in this field. And there is even some competition, I think you could say, between actors, because I think without explicitating it, they understand that those who are in power to frame what the legal framework should look like will have some sort of competitive advantage over others, which makes it very important to either be the first ones or at the very least to make sure that what is in there um, fits with the global um, perspectives. So I think it's very important drawing on, on also the book's um, uh, ideas on that, that we make sure that around the negotiation table, there is a diversity of actors, country-wise as well, not just Western um, authors and representatives, but also those um, in other regions, and especially those who are most um, vulnerable and most affected by these technologies. Um, and what I think also um, is becoming clear, I think Gru mentioned it in her presentation, these the fact that it's in these areas of tension that change can take place. And that tension is hence not necessarily a bad thing, right? These areas of friction can actually be good. And, 
think that's also a message to keep in mind for policymakers. If everyone around the table just agrees, that might also not be the best sign because it might mean that our standard is actually too low. And that we're just agreeing on something that is not meaningful enough. And that we need to dig deeper, especially if we want to have that third way. Um, and, and link to that is of course the idea that a piece of regulation like the AI, the AI Act in itself, right, that is now being put forward in Europe, which is, I think, a great start, um, showing that Europe wants to take the lead in this. But the way we will be framing things in the AI Act will, much like a piece of technology, also have an influence on us and our society um, in the future. So it's it's really important to get that right and to ensure that everyone is around the table that should be at the table. Um, and then lastly, um, the last point of, of having a more holistic point of view for me is about looking at AI systems, not just as an isolated system that has some influence on the individual interacting with it, but as uh, something that is part of a network, a distributed network of systems that has far more reaching effects than meets the eye. And, and I think the book offers a very helpful framework in trying to make that network visible and hence making the effects visible. Um, elsewhere, I, I made a distinction between um, individual harm, collective harm and societal harm that comes from AI. So individual harm, to give an example, would be imagine a, a biased facial recognition system. So if that uh, wrongfully picks out someone with a darker skin color, that is individual harm to that particular person. And you can speak of collective harm when you think of the group of individuals with a darker skin color subjected to these systems is being discriminated against. But I, I think we need to draw attention to societal harm as well, to these broader societal effects, which is even if I am not subjected to that biased AI system, there is still harm towards society because I don't want to live in a society that treats people in an unequal manner, in which AI systems are being used to treat people in an unequal manner. Um, because it might not be my turn today, but it might be my turn tomorrow when AI system is biased towards me. So I think, and, and there I think we can make the link um, to what Frank already described as a beautiful use of this concept of love and, and open love uh, of Henri Bergson, we need to put our own self-centered interests aside. Maybe I am not being biased again today, um, but it still affects me to live in a society where that happens. And so we need to look at these societal effects and, and try to um, work towards a framework where we try to transcend our own particularity, our own interests, um, and go towards a truly human approach, um, which means taking into account these broader effects. So a lot of things I liked, <laughs> and uh, I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. So please, Gru, you have a few minutes to respond, and then we'll... Uh... Then we'll have a conversation. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Natalie. And uh, I mean, again, uh, wonderful to have you reading people like you reading this book, because it's just when you hear your own words in someone else, it's just uh, it's just very, very nice, especially when someone reads it and they really got it. So uh, <laughs> and that's how I felt with both uh, Frank's and yours uh, intervention. So I have to say one thing about Natalie also. Natalie was so important for the high level group's work that we actually named a recommendation after her at one point. So people will maybe see that there's something called the SMUHA recommendation. So she was uh, really fundamental to the ethics guidelines. I have to say this because very often you don't see that when you see the coordinator behind, but she was she was fundamental to this. Um, I wanted to, I mean, you picked on, up on so many interesting things, but one thing that I wanted to maybe pick up also at, here at the end that you were uh, emphasizing, and I know Frank was also emphasizing this with the concept of love uh, that I took from uh, Henry Bergson, um, but actually it's not uh, only Bergson, you can find this kind of concept of love in many, many different cultures. Uh, and and um, when I was uh, 
reading this book and it's actually interesting because Bergson I knew from many many years ago but I never read uh, his uh, this last book on on two sources of morality where I have the concept con <laughs> concept from until I, I actually was uh, making my research for this book um, but what uh, what's what what I I mean in terms of the concept of love the reason why I liked it for this very moment in history, uh, and now we can talk about values. And as I said, I'm I'm kind of trying trying to also with my book challenge this idea of just talking about values and any values in the AI ethics debate or in the data ethics debate. But the concept of love we can use in a very historical context. If we take for, for example something like the concept of dignity or the value of dignity, which is fundamental to our Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the fundamental rights uh, system, the Convention of Human Rights, then this is a very historically defined value. So when we think about when the Convention of Human Rights, for example, was, or the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was established after the Second World, we were actually um, negotiating and we had a space of negotiation that was created around a, a, a kind of as a response to a very um, particular form of power like this regime of power this identified the form of power that was uh, exercising power in the most horrible way against one particular minority group of people and so of course the the, the concept of dignity was so important around then but right now, when we think about these kind of, and I describe that in my book of these kind of, um, and I take that concept from uh, from um, Sigmund Bauman and and David Leon, who was then developing on this idea with the liquid, the concept of liquid uh, surveillance, which is basically a, a kind of power that is uh, not easy to identify and not easy to challenge because it's not in one place. It's basically everywhere. It's what Pascal also talks about as, as the black box uh, black box algorithms, that's kind of structure of power that, that is we are all surrounded by it, but we can't really find it or identify it. And so the concept of love is a really good challenge to that kind of liquid form of power, because as you say, Natalie, it's, it's non-exclusive. It's without an interest. That's the key thing about uh, Bergson's concept of love is that it's it has no outside, as he says. It has no. It's not identified. It's not, for example, as he said, and he created this uh, this concept in the middle, in between Second World War or two Second World Wars. As I said, uh, with Jewish descent, so he was really exposed to this regime of power, um, and so he he of course uh, was challenging. Uh, this idea that you could have one set of moral values uh, that you just adhere to and you feel obligated to them, but then you can also put them aside if you only have them transcribed or transcribed into some kind of framework that you feel obligated to. And if it's, for example, a kind of morality that is targeted against the nation state or only the family, um, then you can always you know, have one moral in one place and no morals in another place. So this concept of having a, a, an, ex, an inclusive kind of um, ethics that embraces the entire humanity, the as, and also, as I'm saying, um, not only the entire humanity, but the, the planet uh, as such, is very much this idea that was incorporated in the Universal Declaration originally, but uh, probably not practiced uh, later on. And so, so I really, I, I like that you caught up, that both of you caught up on that. Um, I'm wondering if we should just have a conversation now, so. Yes, thank you. So let me, All right. So I've, um, I, I just want to take one um, one minute to 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 add my own comments. Uh, basically, um, it, it's uh, it's been very very meaningful for me uh, to read uh, the the book uh, carefully because uh, uh, obviously I, I'm interested in uh, uh, in the uh, in the very concept of a power relations uh, being a sociologist. And uh, being a, a failed engineer, because uh, before studying sociology and economics, I studied uh, engineering. 
um, that put me in the unique position to see the interaction of different groups and these uh, power relations that always exist. And uh, one of my callings uh, to actually uh, become uh, someone that studies society was very much that idea of uh, uh, being able to expose power relations in society. We live in a society where the interaction of humans, uh, it's a necessary condition. It's, a, it's actually the beauty of being human. Uh, we are individuals, but we can only function as a, a congregate. And, they, and that kind of a unity uh, becomes even more powerful when you think about humanity. So you go from the individual to a small community, the family, then a bigger community, the city where you live, and then the society that you belong to. And ultimately, what you encounter in this process is humanity. So what, a, what a, you three seem to have highlighted in your conversation, all your in different ways, and which I like very much, is this systemic view of relations. And, um, and there's this, this ethical calling saying that these relations uh, are actually um, creating uh, determinate and elaborate and developing norms. And these norms can be apparent. So this power can be apparent as a, in a very visible, uh, and that can be the brute force of the dictatorial uh, power of, uh, uh, of dictatorial tyrannic regimes uh, where we, we can see directly the power. Uh, but it, it can be more subtle and, uh, and it can be a little bit more uh, sneaky because uh, it can go underground. It can be uh, kind of uh, uh, camouflaged by different forms of interaction as it is in democratic societies. But both your interventions and your work uh, has uh, been working to make that power relations transparent, visible. And I think it's a fundamental part of democracy it's a fundamental call uh, to be able to see how power uh, is played out. Uh, so I think that the, all three of you with your work are basically contributing fundamentally to the democratic process by exposing these power relations. When I read the book uh, that, uh, that, uh, um, that uh, Grui wrote, that is uh, built on pillars and the shoulders of so many thinkers, authors like yourself, Frank, like uh, yourself, Natalie. It's, a, it's kind of a really important because I have seen a map of power in the field of data that I've never read before. It's a, it's a very strong and elaborate uh, kind of uh, uh, definition of the territory is a, is a map. It's better than Google Maps because uh, it's uh, there to expose all the different ideas, all the different authors, all the different key concepts, all the different groups that are competing in the definition of our future that will be built on data and will rely on the evolution of artificial intelligence. So I think that I commend your work altogether for uh, being kind of a, the intellectuals that expose these power relations. And uh, I'm really, really uh, incredibly um, kind of uh, uh, respectful of the work that uh, Gru has done with a, uh, with a book. Uh, so in light of that conversation, I would ask uh, the, the three of you, um, it, we clearly are, as Frank said, and as Gru said, we are on the verge of uh, epochal transformation. Uh, so artificial intelligence is clearly going to reshape the way we live uh, as humans, the way we interact. And as soon as you change the rules of the game, you create new forms of power. I mean, this is, uh, you can see it in history again and again. Uh, as soon as you transform society, some groups lose power and other gain power. Science beat the power of gods and the priests that could control uh, the, the stars and humanity. Uh, by exposing uh, much more accessible forms of power, like in nature, for example. So how do we guarantee that transparency and that debate? Because ultimately, I think the democratic process has to happen in the open. Uh, one of the beauty of the imperfect elaboration of uh, humankind, which is the kind of the democratic process, is that that conversation happens in a very virtual space, which is the parliament, the government, 
and but it that it's uh, played out in the open it happens in the back rooms but as is to be celebrated in a public space in this agora of democracy but in reality many of the decisions we are taking the corporations and other entities and our powerful entity are taking are hidden there, there isn't a sacred space uh, for that elaboration of uh, of power relations so what can we do to contribute to keep the transparency uh, should we push for a different form of democracy should we push for the elaboration of new institutions uh, do you can you see how the these power relations that uh, Grusso aptly describes in the book how do we contribute to democracy 2.0 how do we contribute to an evolution because clearly humanity is evolving a, and clearly, these uh, information technologies are contributing to this evolution. We're becoming more connected and we're becoming also more transparent and more visible. So how can we, the four of us, contribute to this uh, process? So I would like first to ask uh, Grui to, to, to respond if you have, a, uh, you have a comment. And then perhaps I would like to hear uh, Natalie and Frank. And please, if you have any questions, uh, please just uh, text uh, them in the uh, in the chat. Thank you. Hmm. Wow, it's a big question. Uh, and I mean, and so I mean, the question is kind of structural. So also the answer is structural. Um, meaning that uh, right now, as, as I said, in my book, I, I talk about it. And, as a, and as you write a point out, and that I'm also making very clear, in my book is that it's building on a huge um, history of literature that that kind of addresses the transformation of power. No, uh, and which many of these technologies we're talking about has has taken part of creating this kind of new reality of power, which in many ways uh, challenges uh, our democracies in, in many in very fundamental ways, and in, in particular in this kind of invisibility of power. So how how do we how do we challenge something like that? I, I think that basically um, some actors uh, that I think have no role, and now I'm being very direct, that has no role in it uh, to play in terms of creating, uh, making the rules in a democratic society, have gained too much power. Uh, so we, of course, we talk about, I'm talking about uh, particular industry actors and, and, and particular stakeholders in society that have right now invisibly gained power and have been dominating um, the space where, where these spaces of negotiation that we're talking about. And so I think that one of the key things, of course, we need uh, um, particular institutions, but one thing we need to do is also to kind of create spaces where, where other kinds of agents are getting uh, more, getting the kind of resources that they need to participate. So for example, Natalie talked about exactly also, and as I'm also mentioning in my book, a book about some of the agents uh, that are characterizing the debate and and some of the ones that that doesn't get, have space or resources to participate so um i think we need to kind of focus on some of these i call them agents of love in my book which is a little bit kind of over the top maybe but those are some of some of the civil society agents that have been really fighting from the beginning that i've been seeing um, in, in a lot of the debate, for example, in Europe, and has been very influential in, in, for example, the GDPR negotiation process and also in the processes right now. Very often, uh, um, I mean, I see them as being defined as activists uh, or as, uh, as kind of only critical, to be critical, while I think I see it very often as a very healthy part of, 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 of a democracy to have these critical agents that are actually challenging and questioning us and making sure that we, for example, as we did in the high level group, have very critical conversations. Because it's the very essence of creating these critical spaces where we might not find the solutions immediately, but we make sure that the values uh, that we uh, take for granted um, are, are exposed for where, what they are, that they are kind of priority setting. And then we might realize that these values are exactly, these are the values we want to pursue to enforce a democracy. Or we might realize that this value is going contrary to another value when it's being exposed in these kind of spaces of negotiation. So basically what we need is to provide some of these more critical agents with 
resources. That's one thing, but there's so many things we can do. But it's the thing that I want to bring up here, and, and maybe we can complement each other with different ideas. No. Frank. Sure. Yeah. I mean, and I think that the um, in terms of the another form of democracy that I think is really helpful here is democratizing the workplace. I think that there is a lot of uh, concern that um, uh, on the ground, day to day, uh, most individuals are really uh, uh, their experience of life is is their work. Um, and as Elizabeth Anderson uh, notes in, in her excellent book, uh, Private Government, um, for many individuals, this is a real um, uh, experience of, uh, of one-way domination. Now, of course, I realize that that book was primarily focused on the U.S. workplace, but I think it's, um, but given the, the predominance of uh, AI coming from U.S. firms, or there's so much coming out of the U.S. that, that that's a, a big concern, is, and, and something that I think that the uh, folks like Meredith Whitaker and um, Vina Duval and others have really been advocating for is, is, is empowering individuals to say no Part of that also involves professional associations. They're more focused on the union side. Um, some of my work has been more focused on the autonomy, the relative autonomy of professional groups um, to say either to, to regulate AI or to have a role in government regulatory processes. Um, so I think all of those are forms of democratization. There sometimes is a, is a worry about a tension between expertise and democracy or a tension between the elitism of professions and democracy. But I, I actually do think that there they're quite helpful in terms of at least um, complicating the power dynamics so that there's what John Kenneth Galbraith calls countervailing power, right? There's countervailing power against that of the of, of big tech vendors and promoters when you um, have some level of power reserved to professional groups or others to uh, scrutinize and perhaps even to um, require conditions on uh, the development of AI. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, um, yeah. I guess I can complement indeed with 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 some further thoughts. So um, I very much ascribe to what both of you said. I think, in a way, the fact that we have in Europe um, this proposal for an AI Act on the table, to a large extent, contributes also to transparency of the process. Because as long as there is no text on the table, you also don't see explicitly what the thoughts are of the regulator and it's also much more difficult to shape it whereas now that there is a draft for instance in europe people can organize themselves take a position on on this article or that article meps in parliament are developing their position on the various provisions uh, member states are and it, it, it's happening in a democratic process where there is a debate ongoing and where different actors can make a position and then try to shape this text in a different way. And I think there is also still a lot of work to do because whatever is going on there is not something that all citizens are necessarily aware of. Um, and I think there to also um, semi answer a question um, in the chat, I, I do see a role there also for scholars, not just scholars, um, I think also more generally public interest groups, as we already mentioned. Um, I think they can, um, to a large extent, play the role of the mediator um, to translate, you know, more expert related um, concepts that are not necessarily easily understood towards something that everyone understands also in terms of what is at stake. Because if you don't understand what is at stake, if you don't understand the concepts in the regulation, it's very difficult to shape your own position on it and then decide whether for your own life it's a good thing or not, or how it should be. Um, and one of the things I like, for instance, about the Digital, um, the Digital Services Act um, that Europe also proposed is the fact that um, public interest research groups and NGOs should have access to data of platforms in order to conduct research and be able to publish results about that um, as independent uh, actors. And I think media can also play an important role there. Um, media at times can be a bit sensationalist when it comes to AI. 
Um, but on the other hand, there are also very good journalists out there who do a very thorough job at demystifying, you know, not just AI, but also the power relationships behind the use of these systems and making this known for the, for the wider public, which is also something described in the book. Um, yeah. So... Thank you very much. We, I'm going to take this opportunity of uh, perfect timing and um, the reality uh, is that uh, this conversation uh, uh, will take uh, many, many hours and, uh, and uh, another uh, reality is that it's going to take uh, a number of uh, years. Uh, we are going to be embedded in this um, a kind of a period of transformation. Uh, I'm, I'm confident that uh, uh, the feeling that I have by looking at your contribution, uh, by looking at the uh, data ethics of Power Book, uh, is that uh, uh, the debate uh, is becoming a lot more vibrant. Uh, the, uh, a little bit the dream that uh, data ethics, uh, the new competitive advantage and uh, um, and also all of your contributions in 2015 and, and 2016, way ahead of the curve. Uh, I think that's the rule, uh, the, one of the key roles of intellectuals is to be able to see and foresee uh, the problems uh, before others and make them visible to others. And I think that the, all three of you have been contributing uh, incredibly uh, to this uh, kind of debate. So uh, my uh, last recommendation is uh, uh, don't lose sight of your job. I think that uh, your job and, the, and that of the intellectuals is to be guarantors of this transparency and democratic process uh, and being exposing these uh, power relations. So keep looking forward, uh, keep contributing. And uh, thank you very much for uh, kind of uh, uh, being here tonight and, and to celebrate the publication of this uh, uh, important book. Uh, I know, as you know, that uh, the conversation about Gru's book is going to take a good part of 2022. I'm sure there's going to be uh, a lot of debate uh, about it. So thank you very much for participating. And uh, thank you uh, all for attending, uh, the one that uh, had the uh, kind of time to attend. And uh, I hope to see you soon and continue the conversation in a few months from now and, and do a version two of this uh, debate. Thank you. And thank you for, to John Capert for hosting this. And data ethics. Mm. Thank you. Many thanks. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you.